Okay, so all the sessions are being recorded, so I will still start pretty much on time. So we, because we'll get cut off at 45 past the, uh, or 15 past the hour, I should say. Okay, so uh, welcome for those who are joining live at the Harassus Asia meeting 2021. I'm so glad you could be joining us today. And our session that we'll be talking to uh, about in a moment is about the Asian centric sustainable finance in mitigating climate change. So the UN has says great emphasis should be placed on decarbonizing heavy industry and incentivizing SMEs to follow suit. So rapidly developing Asian nations in this part of the world must meet their UN commitments while still allocating funding to reboot their economies as we come out of this COVID pandemic. So how will governments, banks, investors approach the novelty of what we now know as green investment or sustainable investment? And how will these support innovation in the sector? What are still the stumbling blocks uh, for this transformation? So I'm I'm, my name is Michael Walsh, by the way. I'm moderator today, and I'm the CEO of the Pacific Basin Economic Council, an NGO think tank established since 1967 in the region, supporting business leaders across the region to represent them at uh, international events and at global institutions to get their points across. So I, I hope from today's discussion, there'll be a few key takeaways that we can put into one of our uh, upcoming reports, which we'll be submitting to the APEC uh, Thai chair that's taken over from New Zealand. So I'm really delighted to uh, see our speakers today, uh, King Hao, Executive Director, Financial Services Development Council, Hong Kong, government appointed. Uh, Kim C. Lim from Regional Director, East Asia and the Pacific IFC, International Finance Corporation, the private sector arm of the World Bank. Uh, Satoshi Ikeda, Chief Sustainable Officer of the Final Services Agency of Japan, uh, based in Tokyo. And Song Hong Park, Chief Strategy and Sustainable Officer, Xian Han Financial Group and UNEPFI Global Steering Committee Chair appointed uh, last, actually um, this year for a two year term. And Stephen uh, Beck, Head of Trade and Supply Chain Finance at the Asian Development Bank. So welcome everybody. So I'd like to kick off uh, the conversation, if I may, by uh, turning to Kim Si Lim. Uh, Kim, We've been discussing uh, previously, as we just uh, offline, about sustainable finance from the point of view, IFC's investment lens and requirements for project lending. Also, you're going to share perhaps today about your interest to commercializing waste recycling at scale in, in Asia. Can you share a few more details about that central initiative in your opening and uh, and let us maybe uh, put a request out for assistance if you need in terms of um, advocating such initiatives. Over to you, Kim. Thank you. Many thanks, Michael and, and PBC, for having me here today. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joined us here today. I'm Kim C. Lim, IFC's Regional Director for East Asia and the Pacific at the IFC. Um, IFC is the largest multilateral uh, development finance institution focused on emerging markets. And uh, the, the, the topic that Michael had asked me to talk about, which is waste and, and marine plastics, is at the heart of our climate action agenda. At the IFC, we are hugely committed to tackling climate change. And earlier this year, we made a commitment that all real sector new projects going to our board by July 2023 20, will be 85%. 85% of those projects will be Paris aligned. And all of our projects in the real sector will be Paris aligned by uh, July 2025. And in this regard, we've also intensified our support to clients in heavy carbon, uh, or carbon intensive sectors such as energy, infrastructure, agriculture, and helping them with their decarbonization plans. 
We're also working with several cities around the world and also here in Asia to help with decarbonization plans. Promoting innovation in financial markets is another area of focus. Since the World Bank launched it, or issued its first green bond in 2008, the green bond market has now flourished into one that's worth trillions of dollars and has created a blueprint for sustainable investing. However, we know that tackling climate change with just green bonds is not going to get us to net zero by 2050. And we're very pleased to see that there's been an early emergence of other innovative financing instruments, such as social bonds, sustainability linked bonds, and blue finance, which is what I'm going to cover um, in more detail today. So blue finance, which is aimed at protecting and restoring our ocean's health, in our view, will, pay, will play a significant role in the global journey to net zero. Since the World Bank reported the launch of the, of the world's first sovereign bond in 2018, issuance has also now begun in the private sector, with blue loans and blue bonds gaining some traction. This is, however, still a very nascent asset class, and we hope this will grow significantly um, in the years ahead on the back of the urgency to save our oceans, and particularly to deal with the marine plastic crisis that we currently have. Mitigating and managing plastic waste is key to increasing our climate resilience. Almost every piece of plastic is made from fossil fuel, involves GHG emissions at every stage of its life cycle, ranging from extraction to transportation, refining, manufacturing, and subsequently the disposal of plastic. Plastic production alone accounts for 6% of global oil consumption, and that's equivalent to all of the oil consumed by the aviation sector today. If plastic usage continues in this business as usual scenario, the sector is going to account for 20% of global consumption of oil and 15% of our global carbon target by 2050. Mismanaged plastic waste causes significant damage to our fragile ecosystems and impacts billions. For instance, the tourism sector, aquaculture, and shipping industries are highly impacted by mismanaged plastic that ends up in our oceans. Globally, 3 billion people rely on the oceans for their main source of protein. Hence, regu besides uh, regulating our climate, healthy oceans are important for food security, preserving jobs, and supporting the well-being of coastal and urban communities. A recent report by the Pew Charitable Trust estimates that the amount of plastic waste that could enter the ocean could triple to 29 million tons by 2040 in this business as usual scenario. And that's equivalent to dumping 50 kilograms of plastic for every meter of coastline around the world. So we at the IFC, we see huge opportunities uh, for businesses and investments in recycled plastics. We did a study earlier this year on four, just four Asian countries, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. And we found that in these four countries alone, the, the value of plastics that in, the, in the waste that has been disposed is lost. And 75% and of that material could be recovered and turned into something useful. And that itself represents a $9 billion uh, value that is lost every year in these four countries. What we need is to help these countries develop a waste management infrastructure to collect, to sort, and to recycle the plastics and to, to turn plastics, uh, sorry, plastic waste into something of value. And this is an area that we're actively uh, working with in, this, in the sector. So I'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Kim. Can I just, uh, before I move on, I'd like to just uh, counter with a question there because you brought up a good point where, you know, 90 plus percent of all plastics is uh, fossil fuel originated. And obviously there's been a lot of major uh, events and all, uh, sort of summits around the world, COP26, G20 and the APEC uh, summit from New Zealand. I was wondering, does IFC have a position on the fossil fuel subsidiaries argument that countries should be getting rid of these subsidiaries and reallocating it to this new direction? 
and some have. I think uh, there was pressure on Hong Kong to sign up to it by the New Zealand folks. I'm not sure if they did. Maybe King can uh, share with that. But does IFC have a, 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 a I guess, a, a, an opinion on fossil fuel subsidiaries? Um, so I think, Michael, that's a that's a, a complex sort of question, right? Because, and, and I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all solution for, for all countries because every country has a different circumstance and a different sort of uh, energy energy access and energy security um, situation, right? Uh, what I think is, is something we should all work through is some sort of an energy transition plan. Right. And, and, and I think that solution is going to be different uh, for every country and every sector. Okay, very diplomatic. <laughs> okay, so moving on to uh, Stephen. Stephen, I'd like to bring you in here now as uh, obviously another very important uh, banking institution in the region, always at the coalface, if you like, uh, forgive the analogy of what's happening with private and public sector uh, investments. Can I give you the floor now, Stephen, just to share your thoughts uh, a little bit about uh, trade finance? There's been a report recently, obviously, uh, submitted by ICC, McKinsey, and uh, the Thorn Business Intelligence ahead of the WTO MC12 meeting around trade finance. I don't know if you had a chance to look at any of those recommendations. But that was really talking about more inclusive finance, you know, being more uh, amenable to SMEs needs. So maybe I can hand over to you, Stephen, and uh, talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Michael. Um, I just just before I, I get into all that stuff, and, and it is in the trade finance context. Sorry, do you guys hear a no? Okay, the noise is gone. Um, uh, can, 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 Did you guys hear a noise? Oh, it's gone. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, sorry, I'd just like to pick up on, on something that Kim C was was uh, was saying about about the oil. I completely agree. Um, uh, uh, you know, our trade finance business we uh, do support oil uh, flows into a number of countries. In fact, take Sri Lanka for example, and the Asian Development Bank is supporting about fifty percent of the oil imports into Sri Lanka. Obviously, our shareholders, many of them, don't don't particularly like that. No one wants to support oil. But to Kim C's point, I mean, the you know, it's the lifeblood for that economy, right? We can't just shut that off, and and uh, uh, there has to be a just transition, and that transition needs to be laid out. I think exactly as Kim C was was saying, and it's going to differ depending on the country, right? Some countries can transition much more quickly. Um, and as we look to uh, sort of transition out of supporting oil uh, for certain markets, uh, that transition for us moving out of uh, the Asian Development Bank's trade uh, trade finance business is going to be different for Sri Lanka than it is for uh, you know for Vietnam, for example. To to look at you know private sector uh, fully moving in uh, to Sri Lanka, where there are some real concerns about. Uh, about defaults uh, in you know in, into the early into the next year and so on. It's a big challenge. Um, so I think this this idea about a just transition and uh, uh, and having to figure that out, tra- transition out uh, country by country is is a is 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 really very important. And I think a lot of countries need to recognize that because some 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 don't. Right? They say, oh no, we, we have to stop immediately. Um, and if, if that's going to be the position, then I don't think we're going to be able to fully include the developing world uh, in our in this sort of transition journey, if you will. Right? You're going to get some real pushback, and I think that there are some some dangers there. Um, so uh, so pulling out of out of that particular issue. Um, uh, uh, thanks very much for, for having me. Uh, as Kim C says, uh, Asian Development Bank, of course, has the same uh, uh, targets uh, to be aligned, Paris aligned. Um, uh, all, all the multilaterals are aligned there. Now, exactly what Paris alignment means, uh, we're also in the process of sorting out. Uh, and the oil would be a good example. You know, 
of course, upstream stuff, refineries, uh, that kind of thing. Clearly, that's you know that's that's not going to be aligned. But what about just the just the flows, right? Just the just the daily kind of stuff to keep economies going. Uh, is that aligned? And and uh, you know, I think the consensus is going to be that yes, it, it is. Um, uh, but but a lot of that stuff needs to be sorted out uh, still. Uh, so we have the same targets. Um, now I'm just going to be talking about ADB's trade and supply chain finance business, which which I had. I'm not going to talk about the bank's broader sort of initiatives in uh, sustainability because you know there there are hell of a lot of them. Um, and I, I just point out uh, there was a McKinsey study. Um, for what it's worth, I mean, I guess it's obvious when we all think about it, but it identified sort of eighty percent of of uh, the world's carbon that's coming out of supply chains. I mean, obviously, I mean, whatever the percentage is, if we don't clean our supply chains, green them, then we're not going to get to where we want to be in terms of targets. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, just in our trade and supply chain finance program, and we work with a lot of banks. We provide guarantees and loans to banks to support trade. And so we have this great network of banks through which we can do quite a bit. So we provide quite a bit of training for banks on sustainability. We're implementing uh, environmental and social management systems within banks uh, so that they can detect, you know, some of this stuff coming through uh, and, and understand how to how to manage it. And the ripple effect with the, with all of their clients, hopefully, will have a fair bit of impact in this space. Um, we're in the process of. Uh, Designing, and then we're going to be launching some new due diligence forms that we're going to ask our partner banks to implement with their clients on uh, 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 you know, on sustainability. Um, and we're looking at you know maybe working with partners, uh, including IFC, and the, and the relationship on the on the trade side. Cooperation is extremely tight about maybe making this uh, 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 sort of an industry standard. Um, so there are a number of, of, of things going on, but I, I'd like to just focus on uh, digitalization because I think that that can can really be a very important key uh, to uh, to achieving a, lo- a lot of stuff. So um, by digitalization of trade, what I mean is uh, where you have seamless digital trade with no friction, meaning all of a sudden you need to have a piece of paper and sign a thing and and stamp, uh, you know, and, and trade and supply chains are still very, I mean, it's ripe for, for um, disruption big time. Um, and uh, what I mean is so that uh, exporters uh, to shippers, to ports, to customs, to warehousing, to importers, it's all sort of managed in a seamless digital way. And that tech, that tech already exists to do that. Um, that, that that's not the issue. Um, uh, so it is something that we can be, you know, we can achieve. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the sort of two things that we're doing to try to address the two great impediments to achieving that seamless digital trade. And the reason that it's important, I mean, is, is that the kind of metadata and transparency that we would suddenly get on supply chains um, uh, would be transformational. Uh, and would enable us if we can we can layer on top of that that that, that digitized uh, ecosystem trade ecosystem if you will supply chain ecosystem that uh, 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 tools to verify and monitor uh, uh, green standards throughout the supply chain would be would be huge so digitization I think is is key as the core so there are two sort of uh, uh, impediments to to. To, to achieving that, and again, it's not the tech. The tech is already is already there. One is we lack the the standards and protocols, so that you know those windows and data elements that flow between the exporter and the shipper and all those different component parts is is agreed, right? Um, uh, easier said than done. So we, with the government of Singapore and the International Chamber of Commerce, created something called the Digital Standards Initiative, which has been up and running for 13 months. It made some real uh, progress so far, and I'm very optimistic. And they're trying to herd these cats, bring together all of these disparate efforts uh, to to agree, you know, those those standards. Uh, so that's that's one thing. A second thing is uh, legislation. Um, and would very much welcome an opportunity to work with everyone in this virtual room to, uh, to, to do this. We've been very actively encouraging our developing member countries 
to sign, uh, to pass legislation on electronic documents. Because even if we get, you know, that, that ecosystem and so on and so forth store sorted, if we don't have laws recognizing these digital documents, it's not going to go anywhere. Governments are talking a lot about how important this stuff is, but they're, you know, they, they need to move on this. And there are some UN model laws that are available to, uh, to, to do that. So I'll see. Stephen, can I, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm just conscious of time, but I have a, a follow-up question, but maybe we don't have time to answer it today. But, you know, this week we were having our PBEC dialogues as well. And we had uh, the Bangladeshi Garment uh, Association, head of uh, the association there, who's also the Chittagong uh, Stock Exchange. So it's amazing how they wear multiple hats in Bangladesh. But um, from a factory floor perspective, we talk about technology and the digitalization part. I think we're still expecting too much uh, at the very end manufacturer, say in a Bangladesh, the, the prime export, especially during COVID, where now there's this increased demands on transparency, uh, looking at data in terms of monitoring quality and how much is coming out. And I think the fundamental thing that we haven't discussed yet, maybe we can with the other speakers, is pricing. So pricing and how that can be moved all the way along the chain and not just be something that brands are forcing the manufacturers to change, but then there's no uh, change in the pricing. It's still the same price for the product. So how are they supposed to transform without uh, sufficient funding? And the funding then coming from you know, GS GCF and things like that is has too high a bar barrier of entry for them to qualify for the funding. Um, so maybe something to, to chat about a bit later. But I'd like to move on now to uh, Satoshi, uh, Aikida. Uh, sorry, and... Um, yeah, we're going to get a Japanese perspective. I mean, Japan is known for hugely allocating the capital to a lot of these projects in Southeast Asia. But I'd like to just uh, to share, if you can, about Japan's latest um, move towards this whole green sustainable financing and maybe give one or two examples. Over to you, Satoshi. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that question. And also thank you for having me at this opportunity. Um, well, as you said, that the I belongs to the regulator of the banking sector, insurance sector, and the capital market in Japan. And so, while well, making the capital flows to the uh, sustainable goals, uh, it now it, it has now become a part of the our agenda. Uh, the reason is that uh, by doing so, we believe that uh, we can mitigate certain potential risks to the financial system in the future. And uh, so in order to achieve that goal, um, we need to change the behavior of the financial institutions. And that change of behaviors among them will cascade down to the uh, corporate sector in the end. And particularly the climate change is a uh, our foremost concern, and to address that, um, well, at the end of the day, well, Asia continue to be a growth center of the uh, global economy, and so the end goal is to decouple economic growth and carbon emissions, and so how to achieve that is a big question, <laughs> and the, well, to do that. Uh, we need to improve uh, energy efficiency or we need to transform the certain manufacturing processes that will remit less carbons. Or we can decarbonize the energy source itself or maybe develop certain carbon capture technologies. All those things need to be uh, 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 completed uh, in order to achieve the carbon neutrality in our economy. And now many Asian nations commit to the carbon neutrality at a certain point of time in the future, uh, well, the accelerating that move is the uh, uh, very much uh, necessary in, in terms of managing transition risks posed to the financial institution and the financial system. So while well, we are going to set out a certain supervisory expectation on the carbon-related risks for banks and insurance companies, and, but uh, I believe that the uh, risk management of the climate-related risk uh, is a bit different from the uh, risk management of the other risks. Because 
at, at the end of the day, um, well, for example, raising just capital requirement for the banks and insurance company will not solve the problem. Uh, we need to uh, uh, encourage the corporate sector towards carbon neutrality. By doing so, the, that will significantly reduce pollution risks. So that's the way uh, we think of this problem. So that is why we push for the certain carbon finance strategy centered on uh, three pillars. Uh, one is, of course, that, uh, increasing the green finance. Green finance uh, 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 does increase the uh, uh, capital flows to uh, uh, proven green technology like renewables. Also, plantation finance, uh, that will move capital flows to the uh, hard to abate sector, which struggles to uh, make a certain carbon neutral uh, commitment. Uh, but in order to realize that the overall economy more carbon neutral, uh, that, that is a very much necessary process. So we need to monitor the progress made by those sectors and make uh, a finance to them accordingly. And last part is uh, innovation finance. Uh, that is very important uh, because the, uh, well, almost 60% of the uh, abatement necessary to achieve uh, carbon neutrality uh, will come from the already developed technology, but the remaining 40% comes from the uh, technology that needs to be newly developed. So um, we need to uh, finance those innovation as well. So our supervisory expectation will focus on those uh, things and to move the bank, bank's behavior and the insurance company's behavior toward uh, managing those uh, uh, risks by engaging with the uh, investee companies and the borrower companies to make uh, their business activities more carbon neutral. So, so that is my perspective. And uh, in, in that, in that uh, endeavor, we certainly collaborate with our fellow regulators in Asia because they are developing certain taxonomies or those things. And uh, uh, my, uh, uh, well, what the, the, the concept I laid out here needs to feed into those uh, arrangements in the end. So I stop here. Thank you. So, Satoshi, just very quickly, I have a comeback question. Um, you talk about carbon, uh, your carbon strategy, which I think is fantastic. But in order to encourage the private sector, I was disappointed from the COP26 outcome that we didn't reach a carbon pricing agreement. And uh, how can we really get to it, this moving really quickly other than, you know, people arbitrarily setting the pricing and it can be really very different in the credits market at the moment on two very similar projects. So how, from your perspective as a regulator, are we any closer to getting a global carbon price? Uh, well, my opinion is that the global carbon pricing scheme is very much difficult to achieve one. Uh, well, at the end of the day, there's going to be a national characteristics there because, as I said, that the commitment to carbon neutrality in terms of the time frames, it, it very much varies uh, among the uh, different nations. So we, they need to set out the each national schemes, but uh, uh, well, maybe at, at the end of the day, the, if there we can ensure the certain arbitrage opportunities for well, for uh, well, um, uh, all those markets, then maybe the financial sector will find out certain uh, uh, the, the the certain carbon price globally applicable. But uh, but uh, at this stage. Uh, we still need to uh, uh, see that uh, further development in each nation. Okay, thank you, Satoshi. So now we're going to move to Hong Kong. Uh, King Al, Executive Director, great to see you, King. Um, we're in the same city, but obviously still Zooming or doing the Run the World thing here. But um, I just would like to follow on, if you like, from Satoshi, because you're really at the at the very frontier, if you like, in working on the latest regulation uh, recommendations to the Hong Kong government. 
to keep Hong Kong's role as an IFC being very important to address all of this whole green shift, including facilitating the Greater Bay Area projects of the Beijing government. So maybe we can hear more from you, King. Thank you so much. Okay, um, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, FSCC is a policy think tank uh, for the financial services industry, uh, set up by the government back in 2013. Uh, so, um, as Michael alluded to earlier, you know, uh, we have worked on the uh, green finance the ESG policy framework uh, over the past four years, published uh, three papers with quite a lot of recommendations. And now we are all uh, focusing more on implementation. So I, I want to share with you uh, so far what the government has done. Uh, and I think they're all very encouraging signs. Uh, take green bonds as an, as an example. The government uh, just recently issued uh, the very first batch of uh, euro-denominated green bonds um, with the 20 year tranches being the longest tenor, uh, issued by any Asian government. And in fact, uh, we also did one earlier for US dollar, uh, green bond, uh, with a 30 year tenor. Again, uh, that was a record, uh, in Asia. Uh, so far we've raised about 6.5 billion, uh, US dollar from these green bonds. But what are they, uh, uh, being used for? Um, so the government actually came out with a very clear climate action pa uh, plan. Uh, so to uh, 2050, uh, with three pillars. First of all, is energy, right? How, how we can make our energy supply greener. So uh, on that note, um, I want to go back to your point earlier, you know, subsidy. So I, I think um, instead of providing subsidy, because Hong Kong is a very small city. So what we've done is to encourage the use of uh, LNG. Uh, we actually have a floating terminal as a joint venture between the two electric, uh, electricity companies. Uh, and now I recall more than 45% of our energy actually now is uh, 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 from uh, LNG. And then transportation, we're encouraging uh, um, electric vehicles. Uh, and, th and then uh, also in terms of marine transportation, we are trying to reduce uh, those uh, polluted, uh, polluted uh, particles. I think you know, contributed to... Uh, something like, again, very high percentage, 40% uh, perhaps uh, of uh, air pollution in Hong Kong. Actually, it's not just from cars, surprisingly. Uh, and then uh, waste management. Again, uh, we have plans to build you know, uh, more facilities to handle uh, waste and also starting to tax uh, households uh, on waste uh, ma uh, disposal. Uh, but um, putting that aside, uh, we, we also, uh, because we are uh, representing the industry, also want to highlight some of the uh, bottlenecks that we're seeing. I think that also applies to other countries as well. Well, first of all, our regulators uh, are very proactive. Uh, the Hong Kong EX uh, now requires all listed companies to publish uh, their ESG report uh, at the same time as their uh, 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 EN report. Uh, and... Um, but again, um, we have a lot of uh, small and uh, SMEs right, uh, in Hong Kong, I'm sure, other countries as well. So are we applying the same standard right, across? Is that practical? A question for everyone. Uh, and, not, and, and not just that. Um, and also, our um, securities regulators are also demanding, and Hong Kong MA as well, the, the, the banking regulators, are, um, are demanding um, the regulated entities to have a very clear ESG policy and even down to climate risk management report. Uh, and it's being compulsory uh, for all fund managers starting from uh, next uh, August um, uh, and gradually uh, ro rolling out to November uh, for full-scale implementation. Now, that brings up a problem. Data. And again, Steve mentioned uh, digitalization earlier. I think this is very important. Uh, and, and actually, it's an opportunity uh, for fintech companies. Take, for example, uh, the, uh, we have a, a local fintech company now uh, being able to uh, use AI and big data to monitor over 1 million uh, companies, both public and private, um, in the uh, greater China area. Uh, so uh, that's very important. Uh, and, and also uh, the use of blockchain. I'll talk about uh, controlling uh, pollution from uh, marine transportation. Again, we have a, a local fintech company working with uh, you know, some insurance companies to monitor uh, the use of energy uh, and pollution uh, um, produced by uh, you know uh, these containers uh, live uh, minute by minute, you know, to try and uh, uh, bring down uh, the, the uh, pollution as well as reducing the insurance cost. So there's uh, monetary benef uh, you know, benefits as well uh, to that. And last but not least, uh, you, you asked about uh, 
GBA, a Greater Bay Area. Um, and it is, in fact, it goes beyond that. Because Hong Kong being an international financial center is well suited to help China transform um, you know, the economy to a, a much greener um, uh, uh, overall uh, infrastructure. Uh, because you know, we do have this 2016 uh, carbon neutral target. The amount of money required to do this you know, green economy transformation for China is around 15 trillion US dollar. And um, it's estimated about 60 to 70 percent of that have to be funded by private capital. And that's where, uh, you know, uh, Hong Kong is allowed to play. Uh, it's not just about uh, bond, uh, uh, you know, green bonds, transition bonds and, and all that. It's also about private equity. So how we encourage uh, private in, uh, capital uh, to invest in some of these uh, green technology. Uh, because uh, 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 it, this is also important. We need technology to transform, uh, to make this transformation. Uh, it's not just uh, cutting uh, you know, emission, but also actually we need uh, you know, technology, uh, technological transformation. Uh, going back to reporting, for example, a lot of these um, green bonds right, will have uh, performance KPIs. But how are you going to monitor those? Right? Uh, you, know, uh, you need to uh, make sure that they... they, 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 they uh, to uh, make sure that there's no greenwashing involved uh, and you have uh, new timely and accurate information. And that's where blockchain technology comes in. Uh, thanks, King. Yeah. If I can uh, quickly keep it moving. Um, but thanks, King. A lot to digest there. I'm really quite pleased about what Hong Kong is doing. And uh, if you can mute yourself. And I wanted to bring in Song Hong Park now, Chief Strategist, Strategy and Sustainable Officer at Jinhan Financial. So, uh, Hong Hong, and obviously you wear multiple hats, as we mentioned before, that a lot of business leaders do, including the UN environmental policy or program, I should say, financial initiatives. But you're going to take us through a couple of slides now, just what Shin Han is doing as a uh, conglomerate in Asia in the area of insurance and financing. Over to you, uh, Shin Han. Song Hyun. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Michael, for having me. Uh, I'm Song Hyun Park, the deputy president and the CSSO of the China Finance Group, uh, the chief strategy and sustainability officer. I'm in charge of the both the group's strategy and uh, sustainability. Uh, before I, I answer that, I would like to give you a brief background of the Shinhan here. Shinhan Finance Group is a major financial group in South Korea with 17 subsidiaries. We have a balanced business portfolios, including banking, credit card, brokerage, life insurance, and asset management. Uh, we have presence in 20 countries uh, outside of Korea, including Vietnam and Indonesia. Uh, let me tell you about what we are doing in terms of ESG management. Uh, especially on the crime front. Uh, I will tell you this by using some slides. Uh, Sinatex uh, uh, plan to see approach to carbon neutrality. It covers everything from strategy and goals uh, to implement and reduce uh, and to meet the global standard at every step. Uh, we became the first financial group in Korea to join the international organizations listed here. Uh, with this detailed roadmap, uh, we can help establish international standard and the common language for carbon neutrality. Uh, while uh, positioning uh, Korea's finance industry uh, at the front front uh, uh, of the global trends. Next slide, please. Uh, based on this plan, last year in November, uh, Sinan introduced uh, its carbon neutrality strategy called Zero Carbon Drive. Uh, it involves measuring the emission of the, our uh, asset portfolios and setting science-based -based mitigation goals. Uh, most importantly, uh, we will help companies uh, stay competitive in a net zero environment. Uh, to that end, uh, we are uh, increasing our eco-friendly finance support to 30 billion US dollars by 2030s. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, this April, uh, she has joined the, the Natural Banking Alliance as founding members. Our goal was to drive actions and uh, share our, uh, our knowledge uh, globally. Uh, Natural Banking uh, Alliance recommends that uh, uh, we identify the uh, manageable areas and decide what is most important. For Sinan, the priority on high emission sector of power generation, oils, chemicals, steels, and cement. And we plan to actively engage top 100 companies with the highest emission to rebuild the information and set the mitigation goals. Uh, we we'll also offer financing for SMEs to change equipment uh, for a carbon reduction and invest in technology like hydrogen dialect to reduce iron and the carbon capture, utilization, and storage uh, so that we can make the eco-friendly transition together with our client. Uh, since, the, uh, since that the uh, climate uh, agenda is, uh, something, is not something that we can be tackled by an individual company or, or in institutions, we are also taking Part, uh, taking part in many global initiatives uh, and alliance. Our major global initiative that we are taking uh, participating in is the UNEP FI. And I'm actively uh, serving as a representative of the Asia Pacific banking sector within the UNEP FI Global Sterling Committee. And I'm working with the global finance institution to discover sectors where the finance can contribute to the environment. Uh, UNEP FI FI makes a significant effort to support the finance sectors to set targets, implement, and manage environment-related agendas, uh, such as uh, uh, climate change mitigations and uh, climate change adaptations and uh, expanding green finance through uh, mutual cooperation. Uh, uh, many banks see climate uh, as an area of, of impact. Although positive changes are taking place, such as uh, having already set uh, or preparing to set a net zero goals for mitigating the impact of the crime change, uh, there is a, a long way, a still long way to uh, uh, for to go for concrete uh, implementation. I think. Thank you. Thank you, and. Uh... That was wonderful to sort of see actions uh, speaks louder than words. So uh, it's really great to see what you guys are doing in the region. And uh, I think this panel uh, from a, a non-banking financial background myself, I think could maybe post uh, event, you know, get to know each other. I'll make sure you have each other's contacts. So I really think there's some uh, mutual significant areas to work together on collaboratively uh, based on the different areas that you, you bring in terms of professionalism. So thank you so much for that. So we have approximately three minutes left. So I'd like to just quickly do a quick fire 30 second coming back to Kim. Kim, uh, looking ahead, what's, uh, I always like to do this. What's your prediction as we look forward, you know, maybe in one year or a five year horizon or maybe to the 2030 US, UN SDG goals that are meant to be uh, accomplished? Back to you, Kim, for a quick prediction. Thanks, Michael. I, I'm I'm an optimist. I think um, this is it's very encouraging to see that the whole world is coming together and recognizing that we have a problem, right, that, that with, with our planet, and everybody is mobilizing in different ways. So I think if, I'm I'm optimistic that we will be on a on a, a strong trajectory to achieving our climate ambitions. Thanks. Great, Stephen. What's so Kim is saying optimistic. What are you saying, Stephen? What are you seeing? Uh, Michael, if, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll take my my time to ask Akita San a question. Um, it goes back to I think very important point that you made around pricing. Um, do you think that regulators will be willing to make a price differentiation or or a, 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 a between what's considered a sustainable trade and supply chain finance loan and guarantee versus a non-sustainable, and and make that make distinction for capital. Uh, purposes, um, and that, and thereby driving a, a differentiation on the pricing. 
not just to financial institutions, but then presumably to their corporate clients. I think that's that could be a very interesting area to have been discussing this with MAS uh, in Singapore. And uh, welcome your views on that. Thank you very much. Satoshi, uh, we probably don't have time for you to answer. Maybe you could you can answer in an email to Stephen <laughs> in the event. And yes, I'll, yeah, I do that. <laughs> but, but I can then, Satoshi, while you're talking, can you give us a prediction? Thirty seconds. Uh, okay. Well, at the end of the day, well, we need uh, data uh, for assessing the well, what is sustainable and what is non-sustainable. So, uh, as uh, many fellow panelists uh, discussed, that the well. Green and fintech needs to come together because, well, judging what is green requires a huge data, actually. It's a, there's, there's going to be an exponential increase of demand. So uh, I believe that we, in order to manage that kind of data request, that the corporate sector needs a certain digitalization. And so if we want to go green, we need to go more digital. So that, that's what I want to say. Okay, so more financing coming from Japan. Great, nice. <laughs> okay, and then King? Uh, yes, I'm very optimistic, just like Kim, uh, because it's not no longer a top-down government-driven initiative, uh, being green. Uh, you know, we see a lot of retail demand and in, in institutional demand as well uh, for green investment. Just a, a one quick statistic. Based on CFA Institute, 98% of the retail investors in China are interested in ESG funds. So that speaks, you know, uh, you know Morning. Thanks, King. And finally, to our friends in Korea, any last thoughts? You're, you're on mute. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, in addition to carbon neutrality, uh, we, we should, we should uh, challenge on a lot of issues. UNFI um, uh, try to tackle on uh, natural uh, capitals and pollutions and uh, resource efficiency. Uh, these, uh, these issues are uh, also important issue and uh, we should uh, uh, try to uh, have some solutions. Uh, to have these solutions, as Satoshi said, we, we need a lot of data and knowledge about them, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of my panelists. The 45 minutes goes around so fast these days when it's uh, engaging like this. And I think, to be honest, we need it a lot longer when we've got such a uh, depth of, uh, of of knowledge here amongst us. So maybe we can, uh, under the PBEC banner that I represent today as an NGO think tank, we can bring more of you together. Not necessarily, I know you're all busy, maybe some of your colleagues around similar subjects and uh, share that amongst the wider community across Asia Pacific. So I, I put my hand up as an action item that I make our facility available to all of you to bring you together again to continue the dialogues. So once again, thanks to Horasis and to uh, PBEC for sponsoring it. And thanks to all of you. Have a great day and a weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.